Yeah. Can you hear me? Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for the uh, co-convener and the organizers of this workshop to invite me to come to speak here. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, coastal upwelling, and particularly, I will use this as a case study to illustrate the challenges that we are facing in managing um, and uh, studying marine ecosystem under climate change and other global change challenges. Before I go into the coastal upwelling ecosystem, first of all, I want to ask, uh, how well are we doing in terms of mitigating and limiting our emission? So there's something called the Intended National Determined Contributions, or INDC. Basically, um, you know that uh, at the end of this year, in December, in Paris, there will be a big conference, uh, the COP, uh, under the uh, UN FCCC, where all the countries will make their uh, commitments in terms of how much carbon dioxide they're going to uh, limit in terms of emission. So this is a, a kind of voluntary um, commitments by each of the countries to, um, uh, before that conference. And um, I look up a very really nice website called the Climate Interactive, which keeps track of all these INDC, and then try to use the existing simulation models output to see how much of the uh, warming can it be reduced given this INDC. So right now, um, if you look at the red, uh, yellow line, that's the business as usual. So that's the high emission scenarios under the IPCC or the representative concentration pathway 8.5. That would get us to 4.5 degrees Celsius warmer by the end of the century. Our target is the green line, which try to get us to a two degree warmer world, um, which is under the low emission scenarios of the IPCC, RCP 2.6. What the current INDCs will get us to is a 3.5 degrees Celsius warmer world. So it is only a degree lower than the business as usual, and it is uh, 1.5 degrees be before we can hit the target. And with uh, 3.5 degrees Celsius, there will still be a, lots of risk, a strong risk of impacts on all sorts of different um, ecosystems, both marine and natural, uh, terrestrial, as well as, as human systems. So we still have a, a, a lots of uh, efforts to do in terms of mi uh, limiting our emission, and particularly for the ocean. If we go to a, um, a, a um, 3.5 or even uh, the basis as usual scenarios, it will lead to a large changes in the ocean properties. These include warming, uh, ocean acidification, decrease in oxygen content, sea level rises, loss of sea ice. Um, this is a figure that shows the projected changes in these ocean properties based on the uh, latest IPCC models, at the CIMIC-5 models. And we'll see the big contrast between the business as usual scenarios indicated by the red line and the uh, targets, um, the RCP 2.5 or the low emission scenario. And it, it is not like climate change is the only thing that we need to deal with, with managing the ocean. We are already having a large impact on the ocean from all sorts of other activities, overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, and these all add to the challenges in managing and conserving our marine ecosystem and biodiversity. And all these changes operate at different level of scales and organization. If we take changes in ocean properties, it affects organisms at the individual level. It affects their growth, reproduction, metabolism. This will then affect their population dynamics, changes in distributions, uh, population growth. And then that, that would affect um, species community structure, um, trophic interactions, all of this would affect us through, for example, fisheries, where to catch the fish, how much fish we can get. At the same time, at the other side, these changes will interact with some of the other global change issues, such as changes in energy price, changes in other food supply and demand and things like that. So to tackle this problem, we need to have a holistic approach to look at across all these uh, different scales and level of organization. And coastal upwelling system is a very nice model to so illustrate the needs for this cost scale cost disciplinary uh, approach to deal with this challenge. And if you, if by now you think that this is not something that you are interested in listening further, these are at least the key messages that I hope you can take home too. First of all, climate change is challenging the long-term sustainability of fisheries, and particularly in major upwelling regions where the ecosystems are particularly sensitive to changes in ocean conditions, and that uh, it is, uh, or there are also other human activities that are affecting these coastal upwelling regions. 
the impact will be felt both at locally and globally. Locally, it will be felt through region changes in regional livelihood and food security. It also, also connects to the international level, for example, through the international uh, food production systems. One of the things that we particularly need to pay attention to, yeah, based on my uh, opinion, is to look at um, some of the identified and um, address the vulnerable and groups communities and sectors, and Sylvia illustrated very nicely in, his, uh, in her uh, presentation with her different case studies. And these are the groups that are often ignored in this big discussion, but then they often are the groups that are most affected by these changes. We should consider feedback, both at the ecological level as well as the socioeconomic level, and the interaction between the social and uh, ecological levels. And we also need to look at the role of adaptation, because we will be seeing some of these changes no matter what. Um, so, specifically in this presentation, what I'm going to do is first of all give you a uh, brief introduction of what our um, coastal upwelling system is, and particularly I will focus on the eastern boundary upwelling ecosystems, and then I will talk about the climate change on these effects on these systems, what are the implications for biogeography and fisheries in, in there, and the effects on human societies, management and conservation of the marine ecosystem in these systems. At the end, I will give you some opinions of what I think would be the priority research that we, we, we would want to focus on um, in addressing these challenges. So, um, this is the, uh, a, a, a brief picture illustrating how uh, coastal upwelling occurred. Basically, it is driven by a, a longshore wind um, in the eastern shoreline um, of the ocean basins. And with the, uh, with the alongshore winds, it generates a uh, transport of water mass actually perpendicular to the winds uh, offshore through something called the Ekman transport. And with this transport of water mass offshore, it also brings up a transport of waters from uh, the bottom of the coast to the surface. And these bottom waters are really nutrient rich because all the uh, organic matters from the primary and secondary production that sink into the bottoms decay there and turn into nutrient. So with this upwelling of water, it will actually bring a lot of nutrients to the surface water, driving a really productive so, uh, pelagic system that support phytoplankton, zooplankton, small fish and large fish, and some of the other top predators. And of course, fisheries love that because uh, these are very productive systems and they create one of the biggest biomass productions um, in the ocean. I'm not going, there are lots of details um, about the oceanography and the biogeochemistry of ocean upwelling. And I'm not going to, to de uh, into details. If you are interested to know about that, I would suggest you to uh, look at the, this paper by Francisco Travis and colleague um, that provide really nice comprehensive uh, summary uh, explanations of, the, uh, of this upwelling system, particularly on the uh, physical and the biogeochemical side. And this is the case actually from that paper that um, illustrate that there are four big uh, upwelling regions, eastern boundary upwelling regions uh, in the world, um, in the eastern side of the Pacific and the Atlantic. These are the California Current, the Humboldt Current, Canary Current, and Benguela Current. And this is the, uh, the system that I will focus my talk on um, today. And you'll see that um, the, in these systems, you, there is a, a, generally they have a lower surface um, temperatures compared to surrounding areas because of the upwelling of this cold bottom water. And uh, in the lower graph, it shows the exceptional high productivities around this, um, in this uh, upwelling region. And with this high productivity, it supports actually a thriving fisheries in these eastern boundary upwelling regions. This is the time series change in catch. Uh, from 1950 to 2010. But the, um, the blue line represents the total catch in the world. This is different from the FAO data. This is from the CMRS data, where they add a lot of new information to the FAO data to, um, to, uh, to correct for some of the catch that are not reported in the national statistics. So you will see that the total catch is actually higher than the FAO data. And if you look at the other colors at the bottom of this figure, it shows that um, just from this full uh, eastern boundary upwelling system, it already contributed to more than 20% of the world's fisheries catch. And uh, the upwelling catch peaked at around 1990 with around 30 million tons per year, and then it's declined slightly after that, illustrating that maybe we are already at the full capacity of exploiting the potential of, uh, of this fishery potential in these upwelling regions. 
if we then zoom into each of these upwelling regions, these are the change in catch in California current, Humber current, Canary current, and Benguela current. And you will see that um, these, the catch fluctuates a lot in each individual system with boom and bust between different years, even within the same decades. And this illustrates one, one of the characteristics of this upwelling system. Um, the, uh, the, the oceanography makes the changes in the productivity change a lot. Also, if you look at the, um, the top fisheries that contribute to the total catch in these upwelling fisheries, they are mostly small pelagic fisheries, like uh, in the California current, the Pacific sardine, or the California anchovy. In the Humboldt current, there's the famous Peruvian anchovy tail fisheries. On Benguela current, there are the uh, Cape Horse mackerel, um, Pacific sardine, and Higgs. These species are also have life history that make them sensitive to environmental change. Canary current is a bit special. Um, they spread, uh, the evenness of, or the catch actually spread more, much more evenly across uh, different species compared to other upwelling systems. And these uh, special characteristics of the canary systems actually show up in some of the other comparisons that I'm going to talk about uh, later in my presentation. If you look at it by sectors, and here by fishing sectors means industrial, artisanal, recreational, and subsistence fisheries, we see that uh, industrial fishing dominate in all these systems, particularly in the Humboldt currents and the Benguela currents. But in the in Can uh, California currents and Canary, uh, Canary currents, artisanal fisheries, subsistence fisheries, and recreational fisheries contribute a significant part of these um, of these uh, systems, and th that make um, the understanding of how climate change will affect fisheries much more complicated because uh, there are multiple sectors that will be affected and then there may possibly be trade-off in the way we're going to deal with these challenges. A lot of the catch from this productive upwelling system do not actually go directly to human consumption. They, are, they go into something called a reduction system where um, these large pelagic, uh, these pelagic uh, fish will be uh, reduced into uh, Things like fish meal or other feed that supports that, that provide feed for other animals that are farmed by humans, like fish farms or uh, chicken farms or poultry farms. And then, um, but for some systems, for example, in the uh, in, in California uh, in Canary Currents uh, in San Diego, um, small pelagic fish is actually one of the uh, main seafood supplied uh, for local coastal communities. And I just find that actually, even if you are a vegetarian you may actually be eating some of these pelagic fish without being noticed. In uh, some line of uh, the Tropicana orange juice, uh, if you look closer to the ingredient, you will see that um, they are they're enriched with omega-3, and this omega-3 actually come from sardines and anchovy. So you are, you, are, you are eating fish indirectly, even though you don't want to. And on the climate, there are one of the dominant hypotheses in um, explaining uh, how climate change will affect upwelling system is uh, proposed by uh, Andrew Be uh, Bakun. He published his seminal paper in 1990 in Science. He proposed that with global warming, um, there will be an um, intense uh, intensifications of the low pressure systems along the coast, which will then um, intensify the, um, the, the wind um, along shore. And as a result, they will intensify the upwelling. And with this, it will bring in uh, increased nutrient enrichment and primary productivity. On one hand, that may be a good thing because that can enhance more of uh, the nutrients up, up, uh, that, that will upwell to the surface and thus enhance pelagic fisheries. On the other hand, uh, it may also have uh, an impact because this uh, bottom nutrient-rich water is also uh, acidic after, uh, and, and uh, low in oxygen because um, there is a uh, lot of decaying activities going on in those uh, sea bottom. So with more upwelling of those bottom water, it will enhance oceanification and deoxygenation. It, as a result, as you know, um, marine organisms do not like low oxygen water and acidic water, so it may actually decrease coastal fisheries. Alternatively, if Bakun's hypothesis is not uh, supported, then there may be decreased upwelling, decreased food availability for fish because of lower nutrients, and decreased pelagic fisheries. This uh, Bakun hypothesis has uh, uh, attracted a lot of uh, attention in studying whether it's true or not in the last decades, last couple of decades. One of the more recent studies um, is looked at by uh, Sidman uh, Wyskowski and, uh, and colleagues that tried to look at published 
information and see what, uh, how much of the evidence are supporting the uh, Bakun hypothesis or not. What they find is that uh, they use the, wind, uh, the change in the wind time series as a measure of whether there is an intensification of upwelling in the last couple of decades. They find that um, the Bakun hypothesis is supported based on the evidence um, for Benguela current, California, and, and Humboldt current, but then there are non conclusive evidence for Canary current and Iberian uh, current. They also find a latitudinal gradient in these uh, three upwelling systems where uh, the high latitude regions have a stronger increase in wind stress compared to low latitude regions, which also match with um, the uh, Bakun hypothesis. So it suggests that at least for some of the upwelling system, there was some evidence that suggests that uh, Bakun hypothesis can be used to explain the impacts of up, uh, the climate change on the coast upwelling region. Also, we have seen some of the new evidence that shows that um, there are more acidic and low oxygen waters coming in into this upwelling region. One of the examples is in the uh, much more well, well reported example is in the uh, northern, uh, western coast of the US, um, where um, intensified oceanification and uh, expansion of these uh, anoxic zones actually have a big impacts on the coastal uh, fisheries. Uh, in the last few years, uh, there has been expansion of these um, dead zones or low oxygen zones that kill a lot of coastal animals um, seasonally. Also, um, the increased ocean acidity along the coast there really affects the oyster farms because our uh, oyster larvae that are cultured in this coastal area um, are very sensitive to ocean acidification. So intensified uh, ocean acidification in this region actually lead to mass mortality of these oyster larvae uh, in these farms. So there, was this, there are evidence that shows that uh, support that climate change is affecting this upwelling system. What about the future? So my postdoc, um, Gabriel uh, Ricardo and I um, tried to look at it uh, from the uh, biogeochemical um, province point of view. So we used the projection from the uh, Earth system model for the uh, ocean biogeochemical properties and physical properties to determine the, uh, the defined uh, the different biogeochemical provinces in the world, including the upwelling regions. So these different colors represent different biogeochemical provinces. What we find is that um, in the major upwelling up regions, um, we cannot uh, detect any changes in the, the probability of occurrence of these uh, upwelling regions for California current, Humboldt current, and Benguela currents. The internal variability uh, is very high. So internal variability is uh, generated from the ensemble members of um, the Earth system models. But then for Canyon current, it seems that there is, uh, it is, it is weakening. There is a decrease in probability of occurrence in this canary current. So with these changes, what would happen to the ecosystem and fisheries? One of the most widely reported re uh, responses of marine organisms and fish stocks to changes in ocean conditions is changes in their biogeography, distribution, species composition. So the hypothesis is that um, fish and vertebrates have their specific thermal windows where too hot, they don't like too hot or too cold water. So when temperature changes, if temperature becomes warmer, then uh, species will tend to move away to find a cooler refuge um, in order to maximize their growth. And uh, the fisheries will also be affected by that. So here, the blue fish is the cold water fish, while red or yellow fish is the warm water fish. So we, if, if you consider in the high latitude regions, increased temperature will lead to increased dominance of warmer water species, while in the tropics, there's no new invasion of warmer water, warmer, warmer water fish. So um, cold water fish will decrease, and then uh, remaining there will be the warm water species. We look at it at a global scale, and we look at global catch data, and we find that um, there is a significant increase in something called the mean temperature of the catch, an index that we derived to capture the, uh, the change in species composition of fisheries catch. So the increase in uh, mean temperature of the catch means that there is an increased dominance of warmer water species. And uh, in the, the subtropical or temperate region, the catch, the increase in MTC mimics the increase in sea surface temperature, even after accounting for the effects of, uh, of, of fishing. While uh, in the tropical area, um, it levels off because there's no new invasions of the um, even warmer water species. How about in upwelling region? So we extract our data and just focus on the upwelling region. Here, the horizontal axis is the observed uh, mean temperature of the catch from 1971 to 2009. 
Um, and then the vertical axis is a predicted MTC. So we applied our simulation models that predict the change in distribution and catch of different species, and then calculate um, the mean temperature of the catch from this model prediction. So that provides us with a theoretical um, expectation of what the MTC change should be uh, given our understanding of change in the ocean conditions during this period. What we find is that there is general agreement between the observations and predictions. Um, it's interesting that uh, Humboldt current and Benguela current shows a decrease in mean temperature of the catch, which match with some uh, our expectation because uh, with uh, intensified coastal upwelling region, we would expect that there will be more colder waters upwelling into the surface. So that may drive uh, some of the warmer water species uh, out, and thus uh, leading to a decrease in mean temperature of the catch. Um, Candy current actually has a warming signal, so there is uh, an increase in uh, uh, mean temperature of the catch. While for California currents, we are looking at much broader regions, the whole Californian large marine ecosystem. That includes a lot of area where that, that shows uh, significant warming. So that's explaining why there's a warming trend and increase in MTC in California current. And if we project that into the future, MTC changes actually will continue um, in the next few decades um, with potentially um, intensifications of the change in MTC in the Humboldt current, um, Canary current. Uh, there's maybe a decrease in the California current MTC. Uh, and the uh, Benguela current doesn't change, that, the rate of change doesn't change that much, which shows that we will be seeing more of these changes in species compositions in the next few decades, given our model predictions. How about the change in the bulk of the fisheries catch? So we look, we, we, there will be change in species composition of catch. How about the overall magnitude? <laughs> if we look at the global scale, Fisheries catch are significantly related to primary productions, um, accounting for the, the trophic level of different species. And uh, we look at, uh, we find a significant correlation, for example, of looking at the uh, maximum catch potential of different species in the world, which are significantly related to uh, the uh, net primary productions, uh, the trophic transfer efficiency, and the trophic level of that species. So net primary productivity is significantly and positively related to catch. If we then zoom down into the upwelling regions, the relationship holds. Um, these are the relationship between the observed uh, catch and the predicted catch um, based on the net power production, trophic level, and uh, trophic transfer efficiency. Um, they are all significantly related, and uh, particularly in the Humboldt current and Benguela current. One thing that is interesting is that uh, we did an exploratory analysis using uh, outputs from Earth system models. Um, where, which provide uh, outputs on the productivity of zooplankton. And we add that into the, our empirical models. What we find is that uh, actually, actually adding zooplankton uh, significantly improve the model fit. That suggests that um, the relationship between net point production and uh, higher, level trophic, higher trophic level production, such as fish and invertebrates, uh, may, be may be motivated by uh, the mid trophic level, uh, the zooplankton, which makes um, the competition. Uh, and, and uh, will be affected by the more complicated trophic dynamics that involve phytoplankton, zooplankton, and fish production. So far, we have, I've been talking a lot on the bottom-up effect, so how changes in the uh, ocean conditions, the physical conditions, affect net prior production, and that affects fish production. But then, fisheries is there's all the, also another component, which is um, how much we fish, fishing effort. So we look at the relative importance of the bottom up effects and the fishing effects on controlling the amount of fish that we can catch in different ecosystems, including the eastern boundary of leveling uh, ecosystems here. Um, we look at the uh, catch time series and try to relate that to uh, sea surface temperature, time series of fishing effort, and, time, uh, and, and changes in core fuel A concentration. What we find is that uh, for the eastern boundary of welling regions in here, here, here and here, they are all um, dominated, uh, the effect, the changes in the fisheries catch are all mainly dominated by the uh, bottom-up effects, the changes in uh, core fuel A concentration, which is an indication of net prior production. But the history of our exploitation also, also matters. So we look at uh, the time series changes of catch and see how the, uh, these top-down and bottom-up factors 
actually would pay a different roles in different time period. So we use something called the dynamic factor analysis to look at that, um, correlating the um, changes in the total fisheries catch in different large marine ecosystems with, uh, again, fishing effort, um, that, uh, sea surface temperature, and core fuel aid uh, concentration. Here, um, these are the different profiles that can be summarized uh, from all the large marine ecosystems. We can summarize into three different profiles. And I just want to focus on profile one because that's the one that all the eastern boundary upwelling systems are related to. So black is a fishing effect. Um, the gray and the gray area represent the bottom of the effects from, um, from, from environmental change. So in these upwelling systems, initially, uh, fishing and uh, environmental change play a more or less equal role in affecting fisheries catch, which makes sense. Uh, this upwelling system is really strongly portable dominated, but you need fishing to catch the fish. But then, as fisheries develop, um, the, the effect of fishing actually reduces. This means that um, the fisheries, as it becomes more and more fully exploited, it becomes more sensitive to environmental change. You are at the, at the carrying capacity of the fishery, of the system in fishing them, so there is not much scope of changing your fishing effort in order to moderate your catch. How much you are catching actually will be more dependent on how much the production there are in the ecosystem. So it means that by fully exploiting these uh, systems, we, um, we become more dependent or more sensitive to environmental change in these systems as well. So what about the future? In order to make some projections and scenario for the future, we use a simulation modeling approach. So we put in projected change in primary production, uh, species distribution, uh, trophic level of the organisms, um, their body size into a um, simulation models. Uh, it's a model that I developed called the dynamic biochemical envelope models that link um, this bio, the ecophysiology of fish to the ecologies and how they would distribute uh, with changes in production, productivity and ocean conditions and how fisheries catch can be affected by that. So I won't go into the details about this modeling approach. If you are interested, I, I'm happy to talk with you about that after my talk. So this is the projected changes in uh, the fishery catch potential in the world uh, under the RCP 8.5, the business as usual scenario, by the mid 21st century. The red means decrease and uh, uh, blue means an increase. If we zoom into the eastern boundary upwelling regions area, we see that, um, that we project a general uh, slight decrease in the uh, fisheries catch potential in this region. The uh, wet area uh, uncertainty generated from internal variability. Upwelling are known to vary, they ha have a high interannual variations, and these internal variability are generated by looking at 30 different ensemble members of the GFDL um, ESM 2, uh, 2M models. So, um, with this large variability of the systems, um, we, don't, we probably will, will not see a significant um, detectable decrease in catch potential in lots of the eastern boundary upwelling systems, except perhaps in Benguela system. And uh, with these changes in the potential catch, there will be consequences on human society. One of the consequences is through economics. So we try to link these projections with um, our different uh, databases in terms of price of fish, cost of fishing, um, different types of gear, what types of gear that catch this fish, in order to come up with um, an estimate of how changes in this catch by species would affect the uh, overall economic values of the upwelling fisheries. What we find is that um, the, this is uh, a plot of the HDI, which is the Human Development Index, so the lower the index, the more developing status the fishery, uh, the, the country is. And the vertical axis is the, uh, is the percentage change in cat, uh, land values, the total values of the fisheries. For the um, three of the four upwelling regions, the Senegal, the uh, Canary current systems, uh, Namibia, which represents the Benguela current, and the Peru, which is the um, Humboldt current, it sh all shows a decrease in the um, in uh, the projected land value. And with that, that would actually affect not only the fishermen in these upwelling regions, but for every other parts of the world. This is a really nice study by uh, Corker and also uh, co-authored by, uh, by Eddie, Eddie Edison that look at how the 
protection in these, some of these uh, upwelling regions will affect other areas through the um, trade of forage fish in the world. For example, um, the use of different models but also project a decrease in catch potential uh, in the Peru, which is the models that Juliet produced, uh, developed uh, the size-based model. That, um, and with that decrease, it will affect North America, Europe, and China because they are the, bulk, uh, more, uh, the importer of fish meals. And that may actually increase possibly fish price because we know that aquaculture will continue to expand rapidly in the next few decades. There will be increasing demand for fish meal even though we factor in technological improvement of reducing the need of fish meal. And with then decrease in supply of uh, forage fish for reduction fisheries, it may actually fish, push up fish meal and have subsequent um, consequences on the price of these fish for the world. Not only the, um, the industrial fisheries will be affected, but um, for some of these coastal uh, subsistence fisheries will also be affected. In some cases, this will be the most, possibly be more impacted um, compared to the industrial sectors. So in this particular case study, we look at um, the coastal fisheries in West Africa. Um, these are the countries which have a strong dependence on fish protein for their annual protein diet. And we find that uh, in all this area, we project a decrease in the potential catch in this area that lead to a decrease in uh, protein supply to them. And um, this may actually push a loss of a, a, lot, a substantial proportion of the, uh, of the population in these regions to become malnutritioned because uh, of their high dependency of fish proteins for their diet. So, with all these impacts, we need to take actions. There are currently still uh, quite a few options that we can take in order to mitigate some and, and avoid some of these impacts. We can mitigate emissions, we can uh, protect our ecosystem to reduce other stresses so that we can build capacity to, to adapt. Uh, we can do active adaptation, so changing our practice, changing our behavior, or we can do repair. If the damage of the ecosystem is not that severe, we may be able to do some uh, intervention that can allow us to repair the system and so avoid some of the impacts. But one of the things is, if we continue to do business as usual, the availability of these options will decrease really rapidly. So, for example, um, if changes in the um, co uh, catch is very rapid and high, then um, even though we adapt rapidly, the risk will not be totally avoided. We will see some residual impacts associated with that. So, with that, um, what I want to summarize my talk, this is the last slide, um, is to identify some of the inter interdisciplinary research needs that we, I think uh, would be needed uh, for the upwelling regions and also for the, uh, in general, for marine ecosystems. First of all, we need to identify the vulnerable and often ignore groups, uh, sectors and communities that will be affected by global change. And these are also often groups that are not involved in um, decision making such as uh, indigenous communities or small-scale fisheries communities. They are often the people who have the least capacity to deal with all these changes. We need to deal with multiple stresses. Climate change involves different dimensions of changes. At the same time, it also affects, uh, there are also other human activities that are affecting the system. We need to look at the feedbacks um, from the biophysical aspect to the economics, um, also at cost scale, from local scale to global scale. And that uh, we need to also think seriously about uh, what our scope of adaptations, how much risk we can do reduce by doing these adaptation op options, and very importantly, the cost and uh, the implications for the well-being associated with these uh, uh, adaptation options. With that, um, I want to thank the funders of my uh, talk, uh, of my works, as well as colleagues who helped provide uh, inputs to my presentations. Thank you very much. Yes. Happy to take some questions? Yes, I am. Any questions? Sylvia. Thanks, a very nice presentation. You mentioned there's something that caught my attention is this shifting on species composition. And I think that that can have a very important impact in market. Mm -hmm. I know I remember going in, in, in Peru, they were talking about the ship between sardine and anchovy, and that's happening also in terms of management, like in the northern California, 
where they share Canada, Mexico, and the States. Yes. They share the, the resources. So the implications are, are very important, and sometimes I don't know if they are well acknowledged. So, you know, if you want to expand about the, the shifting on species compositions is, is, and the yeah. impact in the management and markets. So. Yeah, that's, that's very, very true. Um, the, I mean, there's one area that hasn't been done a lot in, in terms of the implications of these changes in species composition uh, on the, for example, the economics um, of that, uh, the, how this affects demand and supply, uh, how much uh, adapt adaptations the, both the fisheries as well as the markets can have in order to deal with these, um, these changes in species compositions. Um, and uh, that's something I think is, is needed to deal with. Um, and also, uh, what kind of governance or management approach one can actually build in to help to adapt this? So one of the examples is that uh, in, in, it's not about upwelling, but in the, in the North Sea, they are seeing these um, expansions of the uh, European um, hake in the, in the system because it's a warm water species. And um, so they are trying to deal with that like, because of the implication for bycatch, implication for quotas, and things like that. So I think that's an area that actually really need to be uh, addressed. Thank you. There's a few out there. Um, we'll go up there first, the gentleman with the glasses and then we'll... Hi, thank you for your presentation. You know, uh, my question or clarification is related to both your talk and Sylvia's talk. You know, in your talk, you tend to talk about a predictable system by doing modelings and, uh, um, you know, predicting things uh, for future, uh, which is possible, but at the same time questionable mm -hmm. to a great extent. You know, so you talked about predictions with regard to maximum catch, um, whereas uh, Sylvia talked about recognizing uncertainty and, uh, you know, how to what extent we can actually as humans. Uh, uh, you know, uh, deal with uncertainties, you know, so uh, I, I would like to hear more uh, on your thoughts about, you know, how do you deal with uh, systems that are unpredictable at the same time, predictable, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it all depends on what lens you use. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important question uh, about uh, uncertainty. And that's, I mean, what now is uh, a large part of my research actually is dealing with um, uncertainty, trying to capture how, how much uncertainty are we in projecting the futures and how can we build more confidence in our, um, our, our projections. I think we live in a world of uncertainty. Every decision that we make are uncertain. So I think it is to, on one hand, we can, has some, in, some, in, in some case, can improve our ability to quantify these uncertainties and build more confidence on our projections by improving our science, our modeling techniques, and things like that. But on the, on the other hand, we also need to find an approach to deal with this uncertainty. There are a lot of ways that we can do, as Sylvia mentioned, some of the uh, governance uh, issues that actually would be able to adapt to uncertainty. Um, and uh, one aspect is, for example, we can, um, we can actually treat these projections as uh, scenarios and use it to simulate uh, thinking uh, both of policy makers as well as for the, uh, for the fishing communities and local communities of what may happen, even though they may be hard, very uncertain. But then by doing that, uh, it also allowed them to start thinking about what they need to do in order to prepare for the possible change. Um, and uh, so I think, yeah. Actually, my question goes very much in the same direction, so thanks for this great overview talk. Uh, my question is a bit more on the scientific aspect and less a little bit on the human response to that. Um, I think you mentioned uh, the multiple stressors. At the same time, we know from the models that you're using that the way they represent essentially these stressors is not particularly well done, uh, especially if you go into regional scale. And then essentially what you have is this uncertainty inflation. I mean, you start already with the drivers that you put in the models and then your uncertainties in the species distribution models catch data. And then we have this inflation of uncertainties as you go up essentially the information chain all the way up to uh, human beings. So in the end, I mean, if you take the pessimistic view, uh, you have absolutely no ability to predict anything. Uh, at the same time, this is information we urgently need. So, uh, so how do you deal with that? And it's related to the earlier question, but maybe you can address a bit more the, the, the starting point in, in that uncertainty chain. 
Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's um, that's a very important question. Um, the with this. Um, I mean, once you move off to, say, the purely physical and biogeochemical projections, and you add, add system components, and that's very likely that um, the uncertainty will propagate and, um, and actually magnifies uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, kind of impact assessment models. And that happens, for example, in agriculture, where you see this, uh, basically, the different agriculture models can have vastly different uh, projections of how agriculture will change and the climate change. Um, and uh, I think one, so we can, as I said, we can actually, there was uh, th things that we can possibly, uh, positively try to reduce some of the, this uncertainty or better quantify this uncertainty so that we know how, whether um, our actions would have an impact on the way um, this, this system would change and the, the level of impacts that would have on our, uh, on, our uh, uh, on, on, on human society. Um, so, for example, um, the, although we cannot project exactly what the, uh, the catch in the, in the next 50 or 100 years, but then we may be able to quantify kind of the sensitivity of how much um, the um, changes in fishing practice or changes in emissions can have in terms of uh, the, um, the reductions of the impacts or risk. Um, so I think that's one thing that we can do. Um, Another thing is there are, um, in the, with, with the global ocean models, people are getting into uh, more of the regional scale modeling, um, higher resolution that provide us with possibly um, improved uh, products that allow us to, to reduce some of the uncertainty, uh, much, uh, ever present the projection much better than the things that are presented today, which is very broad and uh, do not often uh, have a good representation of coastal processes. Take one more. Is, is there any one burning question? You find it out between you. <laughs> <coughs> so I enjoyed the so you're talking about it. My question, very simple question. Do you have any data set about the relationship between the so power productivity and uh, uh, private productivity with uh, so weakness or uphill system, a changing uphill system. Because the starting point, if the uphill system changed, probably we are so thinking about it, so private productivity also decrease. But there's no easy way to get the so get data set or a good relationship between the so private productivity and uh, really, really uphill system, so much influence or not. So really, so in the future, we can get or not. And also, this is also relation to the tipping point. What is the tipping point? What is the index for understanding really, really up in the system had a problem or not? So this is my question. Yeah. You have it. So yeah. because the beyond coming here, I also in the checking about the prior productivity and up in the system, how relationship, because nothing. Yeah. yeah. I think it's um, so. What I'm presenting is kind of the large, large scale, larger scale relationship. Once you go, often once you go down into really specific uh, local scale, as well as for each individual species, there are so many other uh, factors that will affect their behavior. So you really need to have a much more um, complicated or sometimes a different approach to deal with that issues. And and that's why they, they were often the need to use different tools and different approach at different scales. So the, 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 the kind of things that I present today uh, is more of looking at the broad scale picture, doing some summary of that. Um, and uh, for example, in the regional scale for particular fish species like anchovy, you may have uh, the wind changes in wind pattern actually is a much more better predictor compared to net power production, for example, um, in, in predicting the productivity of the fish. Um, and um, in relation to the questions about the tipping point, I think I would defer that to the, um, to the um, regime shift um, uh, uh, workshop and the uh, colleagues who work on there where they, I, I think that's actually the uh, key question that they're trying to answer is uh, at, at what point there will be this regime shift and uh, whether there is a key tipping points that once will actually lead to that shift in regime shift. I don't have an answer, honestly. This is why I'm <laughs> pushing the, the, the answers to, to the next uh, section. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm amazed, but we've actually stuck to the right time, and um, <laughs> we, were, we were sort of worried that we'd be running late on the first day. But um, yes, we, we're having a um, morning tea break now, and I believe we're back at 11. Is that correct?